Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, this time looking at uh, one of the final A3000s I'll uh, be looking at, I think, certainly in the short term, because all the other ones have gone out. I'll explain that towards the back end of the video. This came from Xavier, uh, Zarkos, thank you ever so much, uh, Xavier. As soon as this one's sold, I'll send you a chunk of the money from this, and there's another 3000 that's up for sale at the moment as well. This has taken an incredible amount of time, hence the length of the video here, and I've cut an awful lot of footage out. I'll put some links down below so that you can skip ahead to the various sections within the video because the bit you're going to see in a minute is some live stream footage. I'm apologising in advance for the sound quality and the picture quality, but you could just skip ahead using the links below to pass that part, certainly if you've seen it before. Around there. Um, so I mean, it might be interesting to see how I approach some of these things here. We've got some awful looking components up here. Let me just give you a close up. Uh, can you see these here? They're really bad. So we're going to remove those. We're also going to need to remove these ones on the underside here. Uh, look at those. The, the fascia is completely gone. Can you see that? It should be blue like some of these here with a number. So you can see what size it is. But yeah, these have gone. I didn't expect that these underside ones would be affected. Um, so, I, mean, I can show you on the top side, because I've got spares for all these. I ordered spares, sort of the 10 sets of these to replace everything. So, we'll remove these ones here. I'll uh, just give you uh, an example of uh, how to go about getting those off. The first thing I would try and do, uh, and this is just my uh, experience here, my process, so that people might do it a different way. Try and clean the tops of the metal part on the can like that. Can you see that? It looks a little bit, you might be able to, just a little bit far away there. It's a little bit silvery, can you see that, compared to the ones next to it? You just need something where you can get a metallic you know, a connection to the solder main. That one's looking, looking a bit silvery. And of course, you might just be able to just clean them up like this and just reflow them. But I think not. I think the corrosion is so bad here. So if I try adding some solder and flux to this one here that's not been cleaned up, you can see Nothing happens. It's like trying to solder a piece of concrete. You know, there's a massive blob of solder on the iron there, and I can't get any anything to come off from there. It's just like a big black slab of concrete. And with time, you might get it off. But that, yeah, that's just not heating up at all. So this is why I do this approach here. And you only typically have to do it on one side, because these are small components. Um, and I've got the iron set to 410, go a bit higher. Normally you might want to ex expect to go around 350 degrees for somewhere like this, maybe a bit higher, maybe 380, but I've gone to 410. If you just heat one side and then try and heat the other side a little bit as well, uh, add a bit more solder here. All being well, once the component heats up, you'll find that both, look, both sides of it heat up. And you can just pull it off, just wipe it off onto something, that one's gone. It really is that simple. Um, and you may find a similar problem with hot air, unless you've scratched so that there's a you know a, a metallic surface exposed. There you go, ones come off a lot. Just sort of going to bin those, just wiping them onto some tissue I've got over here, paper towel. You don't always necessarily need to you know remove and replace them, and it really does depend on how bad the corrosion is. A lot of the time, you can. Get away with, uh, I'm not sure if I left that on the board then, I don't see where it went, that one. It's not here, is it? No, it's gone. Um, yeah, sometimes you can get away with white corrosion, just uh, adding, you know, scratching them up, add a bit of flux and reflow it with some new solder, and maybe suck off the old solder, apply some new solder. So I'll add a bit of flux now. But what I figured is, we'll see how I get on with the worst one. And if, by some minor miracle, it's possible for me to get this one back up and running, it's going to give me confidence to think, well, actually, we're just going to do the same thing on the other ones, speed up the process wherever I can, you know, learn from the first one here. And uh, hopefully I might be able to zoom through them. I suspect that's not going, to ha not going to be how it plays out. I suspect I'm going to spend hours and hours and hours on this one, and it's going to stress me out so much, I'm going to want to find some other home for the other ones, <laughs> like other channels. Like, does anybody fancy spending, you know few weeks restoring one of these because that's what it's going to take you if you're going to do it properly anyway you can see the pads uh cleaned up quite well uh not bad at all considering how awful it looked um but there is the components are shot you know they really are
yeah just look at the, the bottom of the pad on that where it joins the PCB you can see how corroded they are I can't think I can re-rotate re it see that side of it Yeah, they're all gone. There's one here still as well. What's that one? Right on the end. Oh, there you go. It's come off. So there's just the one on the end here. No, third one along, I think. Pulled through. Yeah, let me see if I can just heat from this side and pull that off. Sometimes that'll happen, you know, when you're trying to do, do it the way I've just shown there. It's had a little bit of solder as well. You could be tempted to just try and wiggle it, but you know what? The pad's so bad, I'd rather do the least amount of wiggling. You know? There we go. Just gentle, we don't want to snag something. There's a bit of solder there, I don't know if that's a wire. Or I've attached it to the PCB maybe, I'm not sure. As well as doing that, you see all these little wires? Uh, see if I can find one that I can see, see here. It's furry and it's like you've got to scratch the stuff off the top and hope you don't damage the trace be very you know the trace leading to it be very careful just try and do in the center of it fiberglass pen on its own you'll just start breaking traces and things i do it in two stages like that um you know get rid of the first bit of corrosion and then go over the wider area just gently and then revisit if you need to like that top one there still needs more under magnification is the best way to do it But the fiberglass pen on its own generally won't get all of the alkaline off the tops of these. You get like a crystallized stuff on the surface and it needs, uh, you know, like something like that, a sharp tool to scratch initially and then just clean off the, you know, the, with a fiberglass pen afterwards and they usually come up okay. That one there's awful. That whole area's awful. Let's just look at these pads here, you can see that. They're awful. Hopefully you can see the difference just from that little bit of work I've done there. If you're very careful when you with your little tool on the surface of them, you won't damage the traces. Um, but obviously we do need to test every single one of those um, at some point uh, to make sure everything is, is joined where it should be. It smells awful. It smells like baked varta. It's like a mouldy sort of corrosion-y sort of warm smell. Can the smell be warm? I don't know, well, that's how I'm describing it as. Come on. There we go. Lob the chip off. Uh, yeah, not onto the carpet, it's on the mat. With the corrosion though, I think if you if that was let's say it was a custom chip you're trying to remove or something, something that's not replaceable, you don't want to chop it off. Um, doing the way I've done there, you've got least risk of losing the pads with so much corrosion. 
if you're trying to just you know uh, use your solid station and uh, you know pliers on the pins on the underside to snap them off the edges push them a little bit wobble them you might come straight off if you're lucky but um, often the solder on the top side which won't dissolve it won't dissolve you need to do something like that hot air to to get it to free up You can see how awful this is here. Let's uh, clean that with a bit of vinegar first. But anyway, you can see that's far better, I think. So this board has been sat around for quite a while, I am uh, now going to try and uh, progress with this. So you can see as a consequence, can you see, it's uh, it's gone not rusty but it's uh, it's looking a bit dirty, you know there's a lot of dust on here, you can see bits of fluff. The interesting thing is up here, this was cleaned pretty thoroughly, as was uh, you know all of this area of the board here, but look how these have gone blue, so these are definitely going to need replacing, got some more damage occurred around there despite the fact that that has been really thoroughly cleaned a number of times uh, and obviously you know one or two of the sockets here and I've got these and we can remove some of these chips and clean up around there replace those connectors but I'm going to kind of leave that until last we'll start down here we'll start reintroducing one or two of these things uh, but I will clean it first before I start introducing things and obviously I'm going to need to measure on connectivity test in any of these traces that look questionable so for example on these pin headers here I've you know traced from the wire like that there to the pad and I've followed them to each of the wires they go to all around there so I know with 100% certainty that all of those uh, jumper positions there are all okay so I'm just going to reinstall those uh, I can get uh, that resistor back on there get the chip on here I need to measure the pins around there next to make sure that's okay there's bound to be the odd trace here that's damaged so as you can see I've reinstated those two jumper banks there I'm going to fit R14 next I'll provide this little uh, list down below here this is a list of all of the components sort of around this area here I think right up to here uh, now it doesn't include the there's a strip on the underside here it doesn't include those I'll add those later because I'm going to need to fit them on here and remove them from this but you can see there R14 330 ohm 1206 these are all 1206 in terms of the size are there a few that are 1210 look Ah, so this is the thing, this is a nightmare. This first one, it comes up here and it goes all the way up to this point here. And it's broken at two or three places on the way. And it's the same thing with the, one of the ones over here. It comes up and it, again, it goes all the way up to the, one of the vines up there. Again, it's broken in a couple of places. And it's the same thing with this via under here. It comes up and it's supposed to go to point there and again there's a break here so already on that first chip we're going to need three wires so a progress update we've got these two headers here this socket here all the traces up here are okay on these roms actually um we've got the i think this is the 7474 goes here you can see both of the positions on the cap were detached so i had to join that up and uh yeah i was able to solder down there that wire for the uh, the VCC. Now technically the ground's around here so I could have just pulled the wire around here but it's nearer to the ground there and that ground is connected. We've got, can you see two wires hanging through here? I'm going to get a, uh, I've ordered an 8 pin socket. So I'll stick the socket on, I'll trim these off so they're just into the holes here and then solder the socket on. But there's wires from the underside of the two points on the crystal here because neither of those two points to the, uh, you know, the clock to the RTC chip there are in place. All of the wires and traces around these um, zero ohm links here are broken so there's going to be lots and lots of wires around there. I've, moved the, I've removed the battery contacts as you can see 
and I've just removed that connector there. Can you see? Oh my goodness how blue and furry that is. So I'm going to remove that one next. What we may need to do, we may need to remove this and we may need to remove, I probably will remove these to clean up around there. Replace that socket, replace that socket, clean up around that area. Remove these as well probably and replace, you know, replace these things. Uh, that one, mm, yeah, I might replace that as well, I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, it gets crazy on these, it really does. The one I sent to Mike Pearman, uh, it's probably slightly worse than this one. Uh, some of these things here I may swap as well. So having removed that second connector, we'll just clean here with a little bit of uh, vinegar. I'm going to need to get the fiberglass pen on here in a minute and, uh, you know, just try and see what's going on. Because it's just, I don't know, it's all blackened and blue. Bluey green. That bluey green, I think, is actually the copper. When copper corrodes, it goes like that, I think. Yeah, it looks a state. can still see white fur in us around here as well so these things do need to come off at the back um, but if we just uh, gently go over these with a fiberglass pen you can start to see the pads starting to appear yeah what's left of them So a quick update, there's barely uh, any sun at this time of year, I cannot see anything, it's limiting my work here to about four hours a day at the moment, because even with the lights on, believe it or not, the lights are on in here, and uh, yeah, I just can't see very well. So you can see we're waiting for an eight pin dip socket here, we've got some fixed wires uh, on some of the things on the top side here, it's because there's nowhere to root on the underside, I mean technically, like that cap there, the pad was missing to its VCC pin and its ground pin. So I could have mounted it on the underside of the board between, uh, you know, the ground and VCC contacts there. That's one way you could do that. You could use a ceramic with, you know, a through hole with two legs, spread the legs out and mount it in the middle there. That's one way of doing the same thing. But the approach I went with is just to have a little wire there to where it goes there. I think that might be the ground. And one here to the underside of that uh, pin on that socket. Uh, you can see I've got all of the little uh, zero ohm links back on. That was a mammoth undertaking because every single connection to and from these are broken. So every one of them has got like a little wire that goes to it as well as the connection on the other side. So you've got three things, three wires if you like to deal with and you've got to route it from wherever it goes down here to the uh, wire and to the top pin and then make sure that nothing goes to the bottom pin on this side that's broken. So yeah, I, I would estimate to get this far along with some SMD components up here and some SMD components back up here, it's taking about eight hours. Yeah, I know what you're thinking, eight hours, what a waste of time and how, how um, you know unbelievable that might seem. Some people may think they could do all that in about an hour or two hours. Well, uh, I'd like to see you try because you end up having to trace everything. Every single connection has been traced around there and in some places you end up revisiting them and checking them and double checking them, etc. So it's a case of you know feeding a, a, an extended piece of the kinar through the wire, solder it on this side, leave the extended bit on the other side, then route the wire to where you want to go, solder that point, then to flip the board over, reflow the wire on the other side of the board, and then trim off the little bit of uh, extended kinar. So you think you've got it going through the kinar, solder on both sides to wherever on this side. Uh, and as you can see, we've got quite a few wires here. I don't know, I'd hazard a guess about mm, 15, 20 wires there. Now by the time we get onto these uh, keyboard connectors here, the strips there, every single connection has gone there. So that's going to be like an extra ooh, 50 wires, something like that. And it's the same with these two 74 series chips here, which I'll be doing next. I would say 90% of the connections on both of these chips here are gone on the top side. So again, it's going to be, I don't know, another 28 wires. It's going to be really, really horrific under here with the number of wires by the time I'm done. We got away with just three wires on the ROMs there, which is uh, not too bad at all. So I've been cleaning with a little bit of uh, vinegar, you know, it's uh, mild acid. You could use uh, other types of acid, like citric acid, as other people have shown on their channels in the last few months. And because these are quite moderate, and it might not look it, the fiberglass brush is bringing off most of it, nearly 90% of it, I would say, on the pins that are affected. And the solder coating is still there. 
and now sometimes when you've used a fiberglass brush or something else abrasive like a wire brush you'll find it goes coppery now if that's the case you'll need to retin all of the uh, legs and pins and things here but I'll show you afterwards the solder cone is still there it's just a little bit of contaminant on the surface and they're coming up uh, really clean these are so I'm surprised but the nice thing is like I say I'm not gonna have to solder coat them because they've already in solder there might just be the odd pin but I don't think so uh, and then I've shown this same technique again when you want to clean the inside just put it down on uh, a piece of paper like this and uh, just have a go like that These fiberglass refills, they're not all the same. I've noticed this one I've got here is much more abrasive than the previous refills I've used, and it wears down super quick. Every other minute I'm extending the uh, bristles there because it's worn down already. So I tried this yesterday, and uh, it was doing nothing, which I was surprised at because the ROM's all in place now. The only thing we're missing is the stuff here to do with the keyboard. So I kind of expected we should at least get a boot, so that made me think well maybe we need to deal with some of the stuff up here you can see I just removed these two chips here with some hot air uh, look how crusty it is under there so it's going to be the same with these two we might need to remove the, the two over there that you can't just about see so I'm just cleaning here with a bit of IPA this has had vinegar soaking it for goodness knows how long on a few occasions yeah those components there are probably going to need to swap it out I think and that cap and probably these electrolytics it's horrendous and this isn't one of the moderate ones this is not as weak as the first two you know the corrosion wasn't as weak as the first two that I looked at this was kind of like the next in line and the other four or five are horrendous one or two of those have been rehomed actually in the current state so you might see them on other channels and stuff so I'll just uh, go over that with the uh, fiberglass pen next. I'm going to use some magnification while I do this just so I can see what I'm actually doing. So we've got Dermot Sweeney's Flux here. Uh, that's not the brand, it's the uh, Flux that D Dermot's provided. And uh, I'm just going to have a bit of a slide around on some of the bits where I've used the uh, fiberglass pen uh, and the pads just to see if we can uh, tin these up. I'm not going to be able to show you all of this, you can't really see very much from there anyway, I don't think. Yeah, there's the odd like trace that's exposed here. There's the odd via. I can just reflow these with the flux and just have a little bit of a slide around. When I remove the two chips to the right, I'll show you that in a minute. We'll remove it with hot air and I'll show you uh, some of the cleanup work there if I can. Again, you might not be able to see very well because of the light. So you can just about see from there, cleaned up around there quite a bit. Uh, I'm going to remove these two next. This connector is going to be replaced, so I'm not worried about using captain tape. And the other sockets and things to the left there are all going to come off as well. So we'll just uh, preheat around here. 415 degrees. You could argue it's safer to desolder them normally, but the pads are so bad on these, I found that this is the easiest way. You can see we suffered no damage at all from removing those chips there that way. I've got a metal tin underneath this actually just to scan this off the ESD mat. As I say if that connector there melts I honestly couldn't care less because it will be replaced. Because we're heating that chip above it slightly, that one above it will come off a lot easier because it will be almost at temperature. There we go. And again, you can see the benefit of having removed that. Look how crusty it is under there. So it'll just be this side of this chip that needs a bit more work, probably. There we go. So I'll slightly cool down a bit. I'll uh, remove the solder with a desolder pump. We should get you a slightly better view. Yeah, you can see there how bad it was under there. More on the bomb chip than the top one. 
so I'll show you some of this this socket here I've removed one side already cut the socket into two pieces it just makes it easier the small socket at the back I can't do that with though unfortunately and the reason I can't cut the small socket in the back into two bits is it's a pretty solid socket it's not got a gap in between the two sides seriously painfully time consuming this so I just pivot on all the pins here I'm fairly sure I've removed all of the solder yeah I can feel the socket wobbling from the other side and I wobble it I can see the pins moving apart from that one there and if we flip it over you can see the half of the socket here look just carefully pull it off look no worries. So there you go, a quick update. So I removed that, this socket, that, those caps there, uh, the caps here, I think there was a diode here, and obviously all the strips here have gone, all four of those have gone. We cleaned up a little bit around here. What I'm going to do now is make a note of that cap, that resistor, that one, that one, that one, these. Uh, those two are alright. Uh, what else have we got? These four here. Uh, these three here, uh, did I mention that one? Yeah, uh, any, any of the SMDs around that area because you know it is really bad around here, not so bad here, a little bits of corrosion there, this socket was okay but the actual socket itself, the pins were all green originally, this socket still needs to come off, I'm going to free that with some hot air in a minute, you can see what I mean, it's solid, alright I could snip, uh, I might just do that, I might just snip there snip there, snip there and then try and pull it off in two pieces, I'll show you that um, this socket was largely okay but I mean look at the furriness under here it's no wonder when I tried this a few days ago as it is now it still wouldn't boot despite everything being okay down that side there the IOC may need to come off yet because it's really bad around there you know, if this is any indication, it might be like this around some of the pins here, despite the fact this has been soaked in vinegar for quite uh, a number of periods of time there, it's, uh, it's not solved it. You know, you just, you need to remove things to get at this. So, I'll do exactly as I described, let's try and snip. The solder points have been desoldered on here, but, yeah, no signs of movement. Although it's moved, look, the uh, top part's come off look. Hopefully not broken any pads or traces. Now let's come straight off. Look, see if that one will move. Uh, yeah, that one's still up. Let's move it a bit now. Let's just have another go. I like this. Yeah, as you wobble it from the other side, you can see which pins are moving and which ones aren't. And I think this uh, end one here is perhaps not moving. No, it's moving now. One up here is not. There we go. That'll probably come off now. Yeah, they're all free. So hopefully that should now release. Yeah, there we go. Look at that. Yeah, this is exactly why all this stuff has to come off. So after a little bit of work with the uh, scratchy tool and the fiberglass pen, lots of these uh, pads and wires have come up really clean around here. It doesn't look like that <laughs> because the board is actually filthy and there's still lots more work to do. Good God. So you can see I've cleaned up around here, turned up this some of the traces and wires and pads and things there. And I've just tested connectivity between the port here and the connections and then the connections from the bottom side, some of these caps and some of the places uh, down, you know, further down. So I can get that chip back on now. Everything up there is good. So I replaced the 100 ohm there, fitted that socket. I'm just gonna get rid of this one here. This is a 22K resistor here. In the comments above, I'll attach a file that will list all of the components on this side of the board here. Uh, it'll just make it easy, because then you can just go, you know, if you're going to do one of these yourself, you can just go away and order what you need, and not really necessarily worry about what you're taking off.
but if I just uh, get rid of these here as well, these caps, I've ordered some of these, and I've ordered the wider ones. When I replaced the 32 nanofarads lower down, I didn't have the uh, exact uh, wide ones like these are here. They're the same exact ratings and the same voltage, you know, same microfarad rating. And, uh, they're actually nanofarad, 33 nanofarad. You can see I'm having problems getting that off there because the solder's so crusty. But yeah, I wouldn't want to just reflow these. These need to come off here, I think. That one as well. The one up there is okay, it's nice and tidy. So this is exactly why I'm taking these off. This is supposed to be a 4K7. See there, showing 6K. So over the last two or three weeks I've made lots of progress with this. You can see at the moment it's got a different set of ROMs on here. Uh, it will be explained. Uh, I thought it would be a good idea to test it at various stages. Having reinstated all the stuff at the back here again, uh, bear in mind we've done all the stuff at the lower end, it's just the middle part here for the keyboard. I figured that it should at least boot, but I was getting nothing. Now I went round to all the pins of the Logic Probe and I could see activity, and activity tied into the reset, which uh, gave me some confidence it was booting, but there was just nothing on the display. No, it wasn't initialising the display at all, you know, there was not even a flicker on the TV. So that's why I tore down one of the uh, working ones and borrowed the ROMs, and I'm glad I did, because I could have gone round for ages with that, but if I switch it on now, you'll see it does initialise the video, the screen goes black, then it goes off. Now, the speaker's connected, we're not getting a beep, I think it's in the wrong screen mode, I'm not sure, maybe it's cr crashed at that point, I honestly don't know, but what I would normally need to do is hold down delete now to clear the non-volatile, but I can't do, obviously, because the keyboard is not connected, so that's probably something to do with it. But that's a good sign, it is doing something, it's not completely dead. So you'll know earlier on I had uh, longer strips of this and I was like, well, I'm going to have to cut them up. I didn't need to do that, I managed to source the 5-pin ones here and the 17-pin ones. Now the 17-pin ones had to come from China, so I need to unblock a few holes there, just inspect that top thing there and obviously do some connectivity tests, but I think that's okay, I should be able to fit that. Same over here, uh, I'll get that one on as well. So in order to fit this nice and straight, you can see I've just got it sat there. I'm going to uh, plug a pin header in across the whole lot here. As you can see, hang on if I can, just I'm trying to line this up. I think it should fit, unless there's a, a spacing difference between these slots. So there is. Oh, that's a pain. So I'm on the final stages here. While I say that, we've got about a million wires to go on the underside. I'll show you the diagram I did in a minute. Um, so these connectors here. You can see there were about 15 or 16 pins and I chopped the end off, smoothed the ends down, super smooth. And uh, yeah, with a little bit of uh, effort, you'll see that this will fit in here. It's tight though. Can you see here, look, it's tight in the middle, but if you just press it down, and you can see it's like pushing this bit down here, you can then literally strain them up. And if you solder, if I, well, if I solder, if I solder the pins uh, like that, I can get it to be perfectly straight and flat and flush with the board. Behold a scary nightmare of wires. This is the reality of what you will face if you try to fix one with this extreme corrosion. Um, I did pick one of the extreme ones as you saw the pictures earlier on. Um, so it's starting to look, well it will be okay, there's lots of flux around here, it's a real mess. There might be the odd wire that I tidy up or shorten. I've deliberately made them, can you see the wavy? There's a reason for that, because say for instance you solder them dead taut, nice and tight between points. You then come to solder another point, either a wire or a pin next to a wire, and the wire is leading over the points you need to solder. So there is mileage in leaving a bit of flexibility, you know, you can see, you can move these like this to move them out of the way of where you need to solder so you do need to have little bends and curls and them twists and things just to give a little bit of flexibility there to do adjustments i need to reduce the size of some of the solder points here just in a few places but i've been focused on actually doing the actual repair the cosmetic stuff we can do later so you can see this is the diagram of that whole area and I've been uh, drawing over the traces that I need to fix with a red marker there 
you know you can see originally it was just done uh, biro there and uh, I've just used the red marker to highlight which ones I've done so I've deliberately omitted some of the ones around the links here because I think that those are not going to be essential uh, they're just if you you know if you use these links to bypass the keyboard and have a, an external keyboard I think I think that's what those are for so if I have a problem I'll just revisit these the three or four down here and check them but we're just finishing off now with the uh, four or five here and then a couple here uh, one up here goes all the way down to a wire uh, and it's important that you draw wires in the same patterns they are as near you know in the right locations this is why I had to draw the whole lot like this um, and try and get things proportional you know like so these patterns of wires around LK15 for example are exactly how it looks and it's the same here you've got like two and then two sort of offset um, and the same up here you know wires in between the correct pins and approximately the right you know step in height as those three go up that way so that when I flip the board over I can see the same sort of pattern going the other way if that makes sense you know and that's why I've drawn these here as well uh, anyway yeah so crazy drawing aside we're almost there oh my god it works I've spent crazy time messing with this I tell you the last two months I've been working on this bit by bit you know three or four hours here and there uh, certainly the last month here December because there's been so little sunlight so you can see I've just got a flaky membrane here it's got a tear in it but I figured it's probably only going to affect some of the keys and maybe the maybe the, even the LEDs and things um, so yeah just using this just to test it uh, I found a load of connections missing on the MCU here and I was comparing between the other board that was the easiest way to measure that and as you can see it's up and not only that the mouse works and all three buttons <laughs> so I got that right first time um, I'm amazed now before I got to that stage I'll show you I had to hold the delete button down so again I'll do that now I came up with a supervisor prompt originally you see that that red border that shows that the delete keys uh, you know it's been detected and it's reset the NV RAM and then it boots fantastic I'll connect a speaker up to make sure we've got sound the other problem I had is this uh, power connector here it came off it was completely disintegrated the wire so I've had to put a new crimp connector on there can you see that it's not protected like this one but I've got a bunch of these power supplies that aren't going to be you know I'm going to be able to fix every single one so what I'll probably do is juggle the power supplies around and give this a good one so the next thing to check here is the keyboard now bear in mind this membrane has got faults uh, so I'll just press a few of them and just see what happens yeah we're getting keys coming up one two three Let's try down there. Yeah, it would seem to work it. I'll power it off and connect a proper keyboard up. So I am quite frankly amazed. I can't believe I've had so much success. But then again, there's been so much time spent. One thing I didn't show, the keyboard, one of the keyboard connectors here. These uh, ribbons, I coated the end with conductive ink because they were really, really corroded on this one. And I did the same on three or four others. Now, I tested them out previously and they've been all right, but the replacement connectors I've used, the metal in them is really weak compared to the originals. And on one of the connectors, one came out okay, and the other one pulled like five or six of the pins right out, bent them totally. As soon as I pushed them back in, they snapped off. So I had to desolder about 15 wires on the, the it was the bottom one, the, the one nearest the edge of the keyboard down here. Uh, I had to dissolve all 15 wires, remove the wires, remove the connector, prepare another connector. I spent ages messing around and I thought, okay, let's just test it on the ribbon before I even fit it on the board. And I did that and was able to work out that I just needed to smooth very, very carefully with some very light grit sandpaper, the very edge of the ribbon where the thickness of the ink it sets quite hard and it's super conductive but it was just a little bit too bumpy and i smoothed it down tested again until it was perfect it just came in and out in and out without damaging the connectors and fitted the connector back on and then and redid the 15 or so wires uh, and at that point still couldn't get any further the keyboard wasn't working that was when i started measuring connectivity and uh, found that i think uh, two of the connections up here on the keyboard mcu were not going to the top connector there that was all that was wrong so uh, yeah I'm amazed wait until you see the underneath of it it is scary as anything but you can see we got the hard disk icon down here so uh, I tested the hard disk out as well not only did the mouse and keyboard work 100% but the hard disk does as well 
So I need to add some more RAM into this. Uh, the one thing I can do is I'm going to configure, I'll show you the sound is working because I've got a speaker connected up at the moment. Yeah, if you're going to sound, choose loud. You can hear that. So sound is working. So I want to feel comfortable selling this machine. Uh, I'm not sure, it's going to have to be extensively tested. Let's just see if we uh, get music here now. Yep, sweet. So the only thing I can find an issue with in everything I've tested here is the scroll lock LED, that's not illuminating, and I think that relates to is it the 38 just below the uh, MCU there. So one of the traces there is missing for that, and the numlock. So the keys do work, it's just the LEDs not illuminating when you press them. Uh, so I uh, suspect it's connections around that 38. I'll just do some uh, measurements between the two boards here and have a look at the schematics and see what I need to do to fix that. It's going to be two wires probably. So there's two keys not illuminating. Um, I knew it was going to be pretty straightforward. Uh, I know you can't see the schematics very well here, but you've got the keyboard ribbons there on that side of the page. And if you follow them, you can see it's like caps, LED, uh, num lock, I think that says scroll, LED. And you can follow all the connections. And they come along here into this IC. And I did say I thought that perhaps was going to be the issue. And there's a resistor feeding each of those LED signals. So it was dead straightforward to just do connectivity tests from the, you know, the LED there to the connector, the actual connector, keyboard connector. And I think one of them was just a resistor. It was the join to the resistor. It joined one side and the other side didn't go to the connector. So dead easy to fix those two LEDs. So after crazy hours spent on this, there is another fault I'll show you. We've got a problem with the floppy drive. See this? I'm going to check the uh, 12 volt rail just to rule that out. Switch it off. It doesn't sound healthy at all. Might be an idea just to see what's uh, going on with the heads actually. Let's do that. Let's pull this off. There we go. Let's pull it off. I'm curious just to see what's going on with the uh, head there. One thing I've just done, you might just be able to see from here, socketed these up because there's a little bit of corrosion around those, so I removed those and socketed those up, but that didn't make any difference. It's just a motor on signal, isn't it? I think. Nothing's going on with the heads. So let's, let's just try. Can we move this? Let's just. Not sure if this is one of the ones I've cleaned up or not. It doesn't look like it. But I think it's been tested. Let's just move the head a little bit to see what happens. Switch it back on. Yeah, same thing. Right, let's measure the voltage coming into the drive here. But I think ultimately it's going to be a digital fault rather than something with a power. Let's just uh, bring the meter into shot there. You can just about see that. And let's uh, just measure the two connections here. 5 volts, so it must be one of these 5 volt drives. But you can see that's stable. Alright, there's no load on it. Right, so I switched off again. Let's, let's just try it under load. If we uh, connect the data connection up again, connect the power. Now we've seen what's going on in there, I'm going to stick the lid back on because we don't need the lid off and uh, it'll just allow us to sit the drive, hang on, yeah there we go, upside down kind of here. So it's going crazy again, I'm trying to do this without getting the wires uh, blocking the shot here. See there, 5 volts. So it's not a power issue. Now it could be the 1772 floppy controller here, I'm inclined to think it's probably going to be that, but uh, the one thing I haven't done, as I haven't reflowed, you can't quite see it, this, this side of the AOC here, so I'll do that next, I'll show you that, and then we'll clean up around that, perhaps blow it down with some hot air, you know, after we've leaked some IPA all around there, just to make sure there's not a little bit of corrosion underneath the AOC, uh, these three sides have been reflowed, just that back one hasn't. 
So I've zoomed you in a little bit there. I don't know if you can see, it's just looking a little bit greeny down there. Uh, that side, let's say, has been reflowed. So I'll just get a little bit of flux down there. So I've been using this Circuit Works flux here. This came from Dermot Sweeney, actually, and uh, it's really good. I'm going to buy some more of this. Uh, it probably in a you know a large tube like this. I'll just uh, squeeze some of this out. It's probably nearly out of this because I've done the whole of this repair using that little tube. It's good stuff though. Probably equally as good as the uh, chip quick stuff that I usually use and recommend. Can't see what I'm doing here. Right. Yeah, this is where I need magnification, but if you just hold on the point for a few seconds, you can hear it sort of sizzle and burn the corrosion away from there. Bear in mind I have cleaned around this extensively with uh, you know vinegar and the fiberglass pen etc. Yeah I'll need to use magnification but trust me if you hold it on there for a few seconds on the pin in question it does start to reflow. Right it's no different after that reflow and I noticed that the drive is enabled when it shouldn't be so like when you very first switch it on you can hear it uh, grinding away there, oh, it's like clicking, it's like, if I was to guess what's happening here, I'm theorising that the something to do with the drive is enabled, yeah, when it shouldn't be. So the driver is receiving commands from the, um, I think some of the signals come from the BD bus. Now the BD bus, let me just show you, you've got these 574s here, which are flip-flops with um, an output enable, I think. Uh, you know, so they're sort of buffered. It's like a flip-flop with a buffer on the end. Uh, and data comes through these. I'm not sure whether the drive picks up from there, but it may well be that something is enabling these when it shouldn't be doing it, or something is enabling something else here related to the drive, which means the drive's picking up noise off that bus. That's what I'm thinking. Uh, so we'll start with these two uh, chips down here. We've got a 7406, and I think there's an inverter or something around here. It might be an old gate. I don't know that one above there. I can't see what it is. 7400. Is that a, a NAND? Well, you wouldn't believe it, but I've sorted it already. A bit of guesswork, looking at the schematics, and uh, I pinpointed it pretty quickly. So, the interesting thing I'll show you, let me just revert it now, and then I'll show you exactly what I did and why uh, I've done what I've done. So, if I switch it on now, hopefully it should go crazy. There we go. Going crazy again. So, the first thing I did, I logic probed these, that's uh, a knot, I think it's open collector, but basically, because it's an inverter, not gate, if you look at the pin out, like pin 1 is an input, I think, it's, it's low, can you see that? Pin 2 is an output, that's high, so you, you get the opposite of what the input is, so if you get a low on the input, you'll get high on the output, and if you get high on the input, you'll get a low on the output, so if we go around this, you can see high, so we should get a low, we do, next one's a low, so we should get a high, we do, that's the VC, uh, the ground pin, not VCC, and um, we continue on up here, I think this may be an output that's high, so we should expect a low, we do, we've got a high, so we should have a low, we do, and we've got a low, so we should have a high, and we do, so that's that ruled out. This here is a NAND, so it's, a, it's an AND gate with inverted output, a NAND, and if we look at this, so that's an input that's high, so we've got high and a high, so the condition is met on an AND gate, so we should get a low, and we do. And the next gate here, we've got high and a high, so again we should have a low, and we do. Uh, and it's the same all the way around, so those are ruled out. The next thing I did was, while this noise is going on here, is probe pin, uh, the pins around this. And interestingly enough, the pin 3 seems to follow a pattern of the noise, like when the noise starts to slow down and stop, the pulsing stops. I then looked at the uh, pin out of this, I think that's the seek pin or something, I could be wrong, but I thought, well, what's going on here? It's like the drive is getting instruction when it shouldn't be doing. If we have a look at the chips like down here, that's high. So, that's weird. Uh, anyway, let me switch it off. So, the next thing I thought, is it these? Now, we already uh, socketed these as part of the cleanup, so I swapped them around, because the chances of them both being faulty on the same pins and things are unlikely, so I swapped them around exactly the same. 
and then I looked back at these schematics I'll show you in a minute and I was looking at address decoding in particular so I'm thinking about things like 138s and 139s you know muxes and demuxes uh, and it just so happens there's one here I thought I wonder if it's that but what might be happening and the reason I'm thinking of address decoding the, the drive is receiving commands what it shouldn't be doing it's doing something it's you know some some data is getting through to the drive when it shouldn't be doing and that's the sort of thing you'll get where you've got some balked address decoding. Now there's lots of reasons for it. I was thinking it could be a damaged trace here, missing address bit going to uh, a MUX or DMUX or something somewhere. But nevertheless, I homed in on the, I was looking for the, there's a 138 and a 139. I think the 139 is over here. So I probed at this 139 again, and I probed the 138. Everything looked all right, but I thought, well on a hunch, let's just take this 13 out here and swap it. Uh, and that's exactly what I did, I've not fixed it. So, despite the fact these chips all been cleaned up and stuff, and there's no, you know, got brand new sockets, there's no uh, damage or anything around there, you know, you can see the legs on that look all right. I did have to tin it, to be fair, it wasn't fairly corroded. But uh, anyway, we've got an LS138 here. Now, this isn't the right part, and this to be HC1, so I'll order one. And I switch it on now, let's just move that chip out of the way. And if you look at the drive now, no more crazy activity so it was indeed address decoded my hunch was correct there and if i go on to uh the floppy when it boots you'll see this this drive needs a service it's one of the ones that hasn't been serviced there you go i can access it now i get an error there but the key here is the drive is only accessed at the point where i access it oh look it's loaded to there it's just to show what's on it try it again and it kicks into life there we go so there we go that drive needs a service, but we're at, we've solved it. So with that floppy drive issue there, I was looking at like chip selects and output enables and stuff, and I think I was looking at this IC here, IC18. It's one of those five seven fours, uh, so it's a flip flop and it's uh, it's got a buffer built in as well, I think. Uh, and I was looking in particular at its output enable here, and you can see it's marked there S518. And uh, I then spent some time trying to find where that S518 signal was coming from. Uh, and you can see here, I found a 138 with those uh, three signals, S540, S518, S510. So those are, you know, uh, output enables and things for various things. And the 518 is what we were interested in because that's related to the uh, floppy drive controller. You know, it goes right into the floppy drive controller chip. And yeah, that is doing the address decoding there. You know, you've got some address bits coming in and stuff. Um, and that's going to control whether, you know, the, the, the floppy disk controller gets you know communication probably from the bd bus i would think and that that explains it entirely if you've got a problem with address decoding here and uh, that buffer is enabled when it shouldn't be doing communication from the on the the bd bus is going to go through to the floppy drive interface and stuff when it shouldn't be doing it's you know erroneously you know communicating with the floppy controller so the floppy controller is going you know it's doing weird things it was moving the motor wasn't it the motor was going because it was picking up noise from the bd bus when I say noise, I mean it's not noise, but it's picking up signals, it's picking up data that's not intended for it. I'm very pleased though because uh, this machine really has been a labour of love. I've spent more hours on this than anything I've looked at in the past, for sure. I'm reluctant to sell it, to be fair. Uh, well, there's a few reasons for that. You can understand, well you will be able to understand when I show you the underneath of it in a minute, the amount of fixed wires on it. I'm not sure I'd feel comfortable selling it. Would it last? I mean, it should do, because I have been very thorough. And there it is, if you've not seen it before, down Corning, Molico, EM30L. Just blow a bit of compressed air into the track zero sensor up, oh. like that. So the ones I've looked at in the past uh, sometimes need caps swapping out. You can see we've got a little electrolytic there. It's probably going to be all right. Um, and there's a few probably on this board here. May need to disassemble it further to get to those. And while I think ahead, I think it was uh, Vince mentioned recently on one of his videos that he wasn't sure how all effect sensors worked. You can see here that that's a little magnet. As this rotates, it passes the sensor here, that's the Hall effect sensor, and it goes click, it registers a pulse on those uh, connections there, pulse, pulse, so that it can determine the RPM of the drive. 
So on a driver like this, you don't need to worry about setting the RPM. It's all intelligently controlled via the MCU, probably. I just want to see if we can get a successful load out of this, because whilst it was loading lemmings, it was uh, just struggling a little bit. I could hear it going forwards and backwards, forwards and backwards on the disc, you know, reseeking. And it was never completing a load. Let's connect one of these speakers up. And if we uh, just keep an eye on the drive. Yeah, so it's loaded it, no errors. Start lemmings. One of the things with these heads, can you see that little weight on the back? It's got a little weight that pulls the back of the head down, but it's loading now, it's working actually. So yeah, it just needed a clean, that was all it was. Fantastic. So behold, <laughs> the world's scariest repair. Seriously, this makes that A500 Plus that I fixed look uh, fantastic. Uh, the, thing, the, the thing I would worry about with this is if I sold this on, the reliability, I know it'd be good, because I've been very, very thorough. You know, we've removed everything on this side of the board, around here, pretty much. There's very little that's uh, been left on. Um, so, and I've inspected and cleaned up very, very thoroughly. Now, this board, you can see, is very dirty. We've got some large solder points here that just need resizing. Uh, so I'll do that in a minute. And we've got lots of flux around various areas here that need cleaning up. And you've got to remember all this stuff up here has come off as well. You can see very little in the way of damage here, just a little bit around there. So the battery was down here, but you know the predominantly the damage is here all around the keyboard MCU. You know, all the connections uh, on the keyboard connectors there were affected, every single one. I don't think there's one of those that survived. Anyway, so before I do the final cleanup work here and uh, resize some of these large blobs of solder in odd places, uh, I need to get three more caps back on. I'm just flipping the board around this cap here needs to go back on I want to just check those five connections for the Econet module there make sure those don't need additional wires we may well do, we may need one or two wires there and I'll fit that connector, that's a five pin connector just like the ones further up here um, a cap here and a cap there, those are 220 microphone this is the original cap, I'm going to fit back on, that's okay wasn't affected uh, but these two here I'm going to fit with new ones, you know, just like we did down there, so it's all new caps. These two tantalums were swapped out, the legs were just so bad on them. One of them, it just, the legs broke off, and then the other one I fitted on here, and after I bent it once, it snapped off, so I thought, well, let's just change them both. They're slightly uprated, these. Instead of 10 microphone, I think, was supposed to be on there, these are 22s, that's all I had. But it's not a problem, it's just smoothing, that's all they're doing, they're just smoothing, nothing else. So just using Ali's LCR tester here, I think this is the first time I've used this particular one actually. You can see this capacitor checks out good, 43 nanofarad. It's actually a 47, but uh, yeah, that's okay. Cleaned up the legs on it, it's good as new. So that can go back on. One or two of these components, I might show you in a minute, uh, the tantalums in particular, had uh, started to fail. One of the tantalums, I mentioned the legs broke off, but the other one, the reason I didn't stick it on, measured it on the meter, and uh, it was showing uh, six ohms of resistance. So, yeah, that's exactly why you need to swap some of these components. But this was okay. You can see there's no corrosion just there. It didn't really affect that area. So yeah, looking really scary around here because I haven't finished cleaning up. Well, and the crazy wires. Leave it long enough just to flow through to the other side. On most of these, what I've ended up doing is just flipping the board over afterwards, stick a little bit of flux on the other side and flow it on the other side as well. Just to make sure we've got really good joins on both top and bottom side of the board. You can see now why these wires, I left them longer, because when we come to solder this connector here, I can literally just, you know, carefully move them, solder one, and then move them another way and solder another, etc., without damaging the wires. But you can see the solder has flowed on this side here. Final component going back on here now, and then I can uh, scrub the board. There we go. So a quick look on the top side, you can see I strategically put just little bits, tiny little bits of nail polish, just on bits of copper where it was exposed, where I know that's important. So what I mean is you can see down here, lots of copper exposed, I don't care, nothing around here 
is connected uh, via a trace unless it's been properly tinned like that one there to that point so that one there yeah it's a good you know connectivity you could put solder mask over there or nail polish just to make sure that if a piece of wire or something falls on it's not going to bridge things but you know what if you've got pieces of wire falling inside your machine you've got greater things to worry about than a trace although statistically you know you've got more probability when you've got lots of traces exposed but there aren't that many anyway uh, yeah, nail polish where it's needed, that's replaced, that's replaced, that's original, that's replaced. These ROMs here, you can see this one's different, and the tops like have been significantly affected by the corrosion on this one. This came from one of the other boards, the uh, ROM, is it ROM 3? Yeah, ROM 3 had failed on this. Uh, new jumpers down here, new pin headers, gold plated, and uh, new jumpers. Uh, I need to finish cleaning up, you can see it's just a bit dirty still on the top side. And then up here, we replaced these connectors. I made one out of two pieces, as I showed. You can see the join in the middle there. Uh, these connectors here have been replaced, all of those. So we had uh, a couple of the five pin ones, three of the 16, is it? Or is it 17? 17 pin, I think, those ones. I'll get the uh, the one for the eco net on there now. I've just tested, there's only this one via here that connects to that pad, and that is joined. The other ones are on the other side of the board, so I could just solder that back on. Again, little bits of green nail polish just in between where there was a little bit of copper exposed where I used the fiberglass pen. And then further up here now, the IOC reflowed all around it, replaced all of these little SMD components here. I replaced the ones down there as well, by the way, and all of the caps up here, because they were really bad. Uh, lots of traces tinned up here, little bits of nail polish, brand new caps, brand new tantalums, uh, that was an original cap. Uh, we cleaned up all around here, brand new socket, brand new socket, that was socket and socket, 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 socket. That chip was the problem with the floppy drive. Everything else around there was okay. Um, and again, some of the small components up here replaced as well as those uh, 333 nanofarad caps around the original diode. That's okay, cleaned up nicely. And hopefully you gathered by now, can you see like little blobs on the wires? That's the way I've done this. You know, the tiny, the tiny little bead on each wire there. And obviously, you know, the reason being is probably a wire from the other side, that's why they look like that, but the, none of them sticky out here or anything. They're just nice little beads that look nice and tidy. You know, if you zoom in with magnification, they do look pretty tidy around them, no issues at all. And it goes without saying, this area down here, these all these uh, zero ohm links, they're all gone. These are brand new ones. Uh, that cap's new, that's new. Crystal was new, that cap's new. Original cap there, that's okay. And original diode, that's okay. I nearly forgot there, all of these caps here were replaced as well, they're all new. So let's just remove these knots here, so that we can take this thing off the back. Because can you see, a bit of corrosion around the mono video connector. All of the ports are okay here, it really is just that connector. The interesting thing is lots of these obviously look like they've had an Econet port fitted but there aren't any actually on the boards which makes me wonder someone collecting them all, I don't know. Anyway that's come off there look, that's not too bad, a little bit of corrosion on there. So I'll get some uh, deoxy into the uh, audio connect here and just uh, gently clean these things up. You can see that's looking really dirty on top of that. But anyway the main purpose here was to get access to this here. I might just go at that with the wire brush actually, and then go over it with the fiberglass. Yeah, there we go, it's coming off. It's not very much, it's kind of superficial. Obviously, you want to make sure these uh, bits of wire that come off the wire brush don't get back onto the board. There you go, that's looking a lot cleaner now. Let's just get that muck off there. Yeah, it's just dirt, you know, it's like dirt from the environment. May as well uh, just have a clean over one or two of these things up the centre of the board while we're here. Although, the corrosion, you know, never got anywhere near as far as over here. It's always worth inspecting though, because sometimes it can travel. So I scrubbed over that with the uh, fibreglass pen and the wire brush. So to get a little bit of uh, WD-40 here onto the rag uh, and then just wipe over the areas that are affected there. I should do the trick, it was literally just a few little bits around there. we we'll just wipe that dry and we can get that back on. 
Yeah, there you go. I think you'll agree that looks okay. So I'll just wipe over this now. It's uh, coming off okay, the dirt. Could do this when it's in the case, but it's just dark fingerprints and smears and stuff all over it. So the final thing I need to do now is just get a little bit of deoxit into these ports here. Let me just see if I can just get the last little drip of deoxit out of this tube here onto the end of this. Yeah, just a little bit, look, will do. Might even have enough to do the uh, video connector there. Uh, and just do a little bit of that. Corrosion doesn't seem to have got in there. If it had, I'd perhaps take that off and soak it and maybe even replace it. But yeah, that should do the job. So it will have one final clean before it goes back in. So here's one uh, look at the top side and the bottom side of the board. So yeah, an incredible amount of work. So not too bad down there. Bear in mind all of these sockets here have been off and replaced and the connectors and stuff. And then the scary totally scary area here just needs one final clean it's uh, it's not too bad but that is horrendous so I'm just going to do the battery mod to this not a rechargeable one a standard CR2032 here with a button cell holder for that now the interesting thing is when I looked at these before I didn't uh, focus too much on the schematics I just looked at the pin out here to find where uh, the uh, VCC pin was and it's pin 8 yeah but just looking at the schematics closer I see what this stuff here is for. This, there's a position here for another diode. And I looked at this in the past and sort of didn't think too much about it. For I wonder what that was for. And then looking at the schematics of words now, they've got a connector here, LK5. You've got the positive and the negative for an external battery. So what I can do is fit the battery holder here, connect the positive side to the positive on this LK5 here, which then that pin goes to, I think, here, of D1, where D1's not fitted. We can stick our Schottky diode in there, so low voltage drop, 0.15 volts. And then, let's see if I can point. The point of the, the cathode of that diode here then goes to here, which also goes to here. So it's already connected to the real-time clock chip. So the only thing I need to do, like I say, is put my button cell holder on, join a wire up to the positive here, a wire up to the ground on the battery, uh, and then fit the diode in the position where there's, you know, position for a diode. So in my case here, I can mount this battery either way around, but it's important to point out, you see these two pads here and two pads here, there would normally be a 180 ohm resistor across each of those, and one side goes to one point of the battery, one goes to the other, and then the other uh, uh, sides of the resistor here go to the appropriate places. So we can test this now. If we measure from a ground point on this chip here, that's the main ground for the board, and the VCC pin, pin 8 here on the chip there, can you see that? 2.97 volts. So that's okay. That battery was a little bit low actually, it's like bang on 3 volts. They're usually a bit more than that when they're new, 3.1. So that should do the job. So here's a quick look at the remaining three here, which I don't think are repairable. I mean, alright, yeah, you can repair anything. If you put your mind to it, this could be repaired. But I mean, look how extensive it is. It's not just around here, and this is significant on here. This is major or extreme. This is worse than the one I just looked at. Uh, now, the one I just looked at, it was all the way up here like this, but it comes right out around the arm here, all the way around the MMC in the middle of the board here all the way around the floppy connector and around the ram here so yeah it's just not worth it it is not going to be productive use of my time bear in mind it's took me a few months to fix the one you've seen within this video so as i say that's the first of the three it does have a full set of roms i'll remove these roms clean up the legs and test these do the same with the keyboard uh, mcu there We've also got the optional serial port fitted here as well, but is that going to work? I don't know, look at how badly corroded it is. So I will salvage the chips off there. Uh, one of these remaining three are going to go to the chap that has made a replacement motherboard for the Archimedes actually. So I don't know, maybe if I send him one of those boards and I remove the chips from all three of these here. Um, 
send him a set so that he's got enough to get up and running with a one of his boards maybe he'll be able to provide me one of the boards and I could have a go at building a board uh, using the components that I managed to save off some of these boards I don't know I've got no idea if he's going for the exact same type of RAM and all that sort of stuff or has he modernized it so you can use a uh, modern S RAM or something like that so this is the second of the three and it's the same story now with this one we've got no ROM chips uh, I did borrow a ROM from one of these, so that's probably why this has not got ROM, no, any ROMs in it. Uh, so it's only going to have three chips there. I could burn an EEPROM for the fourth one, I guess. But then that probably wouldn't work, actually, because the jumpers down here dictate whether you're using EEPROMs or mask ROMs, so you've got to have a set. You know, you can't just have three EEPROMs and one mask ROM, or, sorry, three mask ROMs and one EEPROM. Unless I had an adapter or something for the, the chip, I could do that just for that one chip. But again, Tons of corrosion around the IOC, tons of corrosion up here, right out into the audio section, all over the floppy uh, connector here and around the floppy controller. Again, pretty extensive around here and around these first three or four RAM chips. Everything around here would have to come off. Horrendous corrosion around the ARM CPU there. Uh, you know, and again, the corrosion's even got over here, look, the crystal is really corroded, the components here are corroded, corrosion around that, even corrosion on the speaker itself. So yeah, it's totally repairable, but would consume an incredible amount of effort. You know, and things like this here are a little bit worrying, you know, the corrosion on the back there, you're probably going to have to replace these ports here. If it's that extreme, you know, the rust on this metal piece here, it's uh, kind of logical that these things here, look that's green as well, the audio connector. You're going to have to replace the connectors and things as well on that one. And the final one here, again, is looking very extreme. It's just everywhere, you know, it's all around the AOC, all around the RAM. To be fair, this is about the same here in horrificness as the one you've seen within this video. This is what that one looked like when I started. So the lid is just loosely rested on there. Now, this had a uh, serial number thing stuck on from, uh, I think it was Merton Court School, uh, Knoll Road, Sidcup in Kent, and a serial number of 01125, uh, I think it was, or something like that. Uh, now, I removed it. You can, might just be able to see the silhouette here. There's just a bit of yellowing there where it was. Uh, now, this is interesting because it's, it sort of echoes something I thought and said in the past in a few videos, that sometimes with yellowing, it's not necessarily that it's been in direct sunlight. You get the yellowing because it hasn't been in any kind of light. Does that make sense? I found that with my uh, some of the things I retrobrighted, for example, uh, Game Boy, and the front of my N64, uh, not an N64, uh, front of the GameCube. When you put them in a dark environment for three or four months and then get them out, they start they've yellowed again. You leave them out in an open uh, room like this where there's lots of natural sunlight and stuff, and they start to de-yellow. So, yeah, retro brine's not all about trying to, uh, you know, resolve something where the sun has affected it. In some cases, it's the exact opposite. And I think that is a good example. Where the label was on there, it's a little bit yellowed. Where the label wasn't, its cream looks like it was originally. Especially since this has been exposed to the sunlight in here all year. But that label has been covered up that area there. And it's not glue. There's nothing. There's no remnants of anything on there. You can see I kind of polished it to a shiny surface. There's no remnant to glue anything on that. So, anyway, I think when that's been in the sun a little bit, it'll uh, start to go back to the same colour as this. One of them went to Mike Pearman, and it's basically because he did me uh, a trade for this uh, CPC 6128 there. And the other one went to Dennis Vandenbroek. So, you may see a video on Dennis's channel at some point. In both instances there, I provided a lot of the components that I had, you know, because I originally ordered lots of components for all of these, and it's only really as uh, I started to go through them and work out which ones were repairable, you know, we came to the conclusion that these three certainly weren't. The other two were in the medium bracket, so uh, we'll have to see how those guys get on with those. So I've been testing this, as you can see, with an RTFM joystick interface. We'll cover that in the next video. But uh, yeah, it was all part of testing all of the connectivity around here. That goes on and off really, really easily. So I've got the alignment of these here perfect. So I can finish up now. I can literally just get the screws in the board. So there's a screw down here, and then there's the one or two that uh, normally hold the memory module in, but in this case, there's the module doesn't need that, but I'll get, get two screws for there. I've got the one for back here, and then I'll mount the drive back in, reassemble it, 
clean up the lid and we're all done. No, I can't pass it on like that, just watch. That was okay. Listen, do you hear that? So yeah, that's gonna need changing. It's just not reliable enough, despite the amount of cleaning. Yeah, I swapped the switch over, it's not screwed in this, let me just show you. No arcing. None at all. Happy with that. Oh, do you know what? I seriously hate this Archimedes. You know the amount of time I've spent on this so far, and you know what? Everything's been working. It's um, It's been about four months since the last part of the video, the bit where you saw me finish the board off. I had this problem before. You can see this is destroyed. The keyboard connects up literally when you've coated it with any kind of conductive ink or anything like that just the ends just a little bit it uh, binds to these and you pull it out and it ruins them it pulls all the pins out and half of them have snapped off same here so I'm gonna have to redo both of those with the way all the crazy amount of wires underneath but I've had to do this in order to fix the mouse problem because even though it's been working fine suddenly after sorting out the power supply issue the switch now the uh, mouse is not going left and right so this is the thing, you know, you get such bad corrosion here, even though I'm not relying on any of the top side tracers, I've literally fixed anything that's slightly questionable, I must have missed something somewhere, it could be a bad joint on here, or it could just be one that I've missed somewhere. So I seriously came close to giving up on this one, but I've invested that much time, I figured that if I could just replace these connectors, replace the keyboard with a good membrane so that I'm not having to mess around with the ends of the contacts, um, and then I'll just fix the issue with the mouse, and we should be good. You need to clean this board still, but yeah, we should be good. You can see what I've been doing here is lifting a wire at a time, and then using a piece of captain tape, or, you know, say four or five wires there, and then write the number of the wire so that I know exactly where it goes. It's very, very time consuming. It took me about 45 minutes to get to this stage of replacing one of the four connectors there, because there's actually four, you know, it's they're in halves, aren't they? So I finally see light at the end of the tunnel. After we swapped that power switch, and that solved the arcade issue, obviously we had the keyboard problem and a mouse problem. Yeah, the mouse problem was just a, a bad solder point. You can see I'm just doing my usual thing. Uh, it's a bit weird of using a piece of tape just to collect any fibres because when you've got this many wires this close, you want to try brushing it. It's incredibly difficult and obviously you risk damaging them. So I also have brushed it very carefully. Um, there's the odd hair and fibre that's just come off cotton buds and probably from uh, the environment here. Um, I've done this under magnification, they're all off, I'm just giving it another quick go here before I go and install it again. If I ever came across a board like this again, there's no way I would attempt to fix it, it would be for spare parts. So you can see here, there's bits covered with green nail polish, it just looks like a major war has taken place, doesn't it? It really does. And you'll notice the battery uh, thing here. When I started having problems with the keyboard, I thought, well, I don't want anybody to disconnect the keyboard. How can I mitigate against that? And that's why I put an extra battery pack here. So this is where the battery is at the moment. And uh, I'm not even sure whether I want to sell this, to be honest. It's one of those that whilst I have every confidence that the stuff I've done here is good, the mouse worried me a bit because that was fine for a period of time and then suddenly started playing up again. Could have just been, let's say, a bad connection because I cleaned it. And then it worked, so I thought, well, I'll resolder re some things around there anyway, and it's not, not been a problem since, so it probably was just a bad connection. It's just a mess, isn't it? It just, it really is a mess. You know, I can't, I can't even feel proud of that, really. I feel proud of it since it works, but not of what that looks like. That just looks like, uh, I don't know, some spaghetti landed on the board and then went black and mouldy. That's what it kind of looks like, doesn't it? So this was done at a completely different uh, point in time, actually. Uh, before, some of the things you've uh, seen there in terms of getting the board up and running. I thought I'd just uh, clean this up here so you can see it's got like some pencil mark or something here. So I've cleaned there with three of these, you know, three rings there. So on the drone, I've cleaned uh, a couple of them off there. And uh, it'll get a bit cleaner when you use some plastic cleaner and stuff on it. Anyway, we'll just uh, clean that off. We'll remove that, I think, because it's, it's chipped anyway, even though it is a bit of a history. As you can see, these marks are coming off uh, really uh, well here. It does take a bit of uh, friction and some IPA. So just a few quick passes with IPA, and I used a bit of plastic cleaner on here. Can you see how glossy 
that part looks so just wrapping up here this is a few months later I kid you not you know I've separated uh, there's a bit of dust on there actually because the lid was off for a period of time but I cleaned everything up there's loads of things I cut here I cleaned up the keyboards I was going to show you that but it's the same sort of stuff you've seen before I cleaned up the back plates and things here it's got you know it's complete I cleaned up the serial UART and receiver chip that's in there as well you can see this one at the moment has an IDE podule working fine we tested the Econet that works fine I was actually using a joystick uh, interface in there that will be covered in another video so yeah this has been rock solid for the number of months I've been testing it since you know doing the re actual repair now as I explained earlier when I sent one of these 3000s the remaining ones to Dennis Vandenbroek so he might not get a chance to do anything with that for a year or two or more he might never get a chance to look at it I don't know but uh, I sent one to Dennis he was keen to have a look at one I sent one to uh, King of Kitchens uh, Mike Pearman so uh, he's already been progressing with that I can perhaps put some photos up just so you can see how he's progressed but again Again, it's going to be a long-term project that's going to take him a number of months at least to get through. But since then, I also sent one to Plan C. Now, Plan C, link's down below. I think he'll probably do a video on the one he's doing. He's making good progress on that. One's gone to Sparks UK, another one of my patrons. Uh, no fees for this, by the way, although Plan C did make a donation to the channel, which was very much appreciated. But, um, yeah, just shipping. All I wanted was shipping on these, so I haven't sold them at huge profits and things like that. I haven't done that. Uh, I was originally told by Xavier, do what you want with them. It's up to you. You don't even have to give me any money. You didn't want any money. It was only me that said originally, you know, I'll send you a percentage of the ones that I sell. So I've done that up until this point. There's two, as I said, there's two 3000s that this one included that will be sold, and Xavier will get a chunk of that. But that's going to be the last ones. I've just got a keyboard to look at. Other than that, all of the stuff from Xavier I've worked my way through. And the third additional one has gone to Rob Taylor, the guy who's creating a replacement PCB for the Archimedes 3000. Due to the problems we've seen in this video, you know, when you get this level of corrosion, you can fix them. You can fix them. I could literally have fixed all five of the ones that have gone out to other people. But this, I started this back in November, December-ish, after this was sent to me from Xavier and it took up until about two or three four months ago to get it working it's incredible how much effort has been and I can't have piles and piles and piles of Archimedes everywhere it's just been way too many I've had too much stuff I've had no floor space it's dictated what videos I've been able to do etc um, so I'm very grateful for him sending them but uh, yeah I've had to unfortunately I say pass five of them on to different people at uh, no you know no profit kind of thing but Pearman was kind enough to do me a swap he sent me the uh, uh, Amstrad CPC and you've seen a video on that and I've got that in my collection if I ever sell that I'll you know give half the money or all the money to Xavier or something but it's in my collection at the moment the only other Archimedes I haven't sold is an A3010 that I've kept for myself so out of the original three we fixed two of them were sold uh, one of them I have kept for myself and again at some point I'll perhaps donate something to Xavier to compensate him for the amount I would have sent him had I sold it so this one was very difficult, but uh, you know what, I am happy with the end result, and it, it, I think it's reliable enough to sell. Um, I'm hoping that uh, maybe a patron who's a bit more tech savvy than your average purchaser on eBay might be the person that buys it. If they do get a bad connection, they can always send it back to me, but uh, hopefully somebody who's you know a bit clued up, if they get a problem with a mouse or keyboard, they'll know exactly where to look. Um, the keyboard, you can dis disconnect it and reconnect it. I try and avoid that though, because you know I had horrendous problems, didn't I, earlier on with the uh, you know the ones where I'd coated the ribbon in conductive ink. This has got a membrane, it has got no conductive ink on it at all. So yeah, it was pretty beaten up this case and it now looks pretty good. There's a little bit of a scratch here, but you know what? It looks amazing compared to how it did. So I do hope you found the video interesting. If you'd like to support the channel, please see the coffee and Patreon links down below. Special thanks to Xavier, much appreciated. Although this has been very stressful to work on, I have enjoyed it. Um, so yeah, thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next video.